several things. Uh, the first thing we're going to do today is not the homework assignment. I will do that. I will do that during the lab time. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is to continue the topics on the stack because I really want to push kind of that stuff through because you know calling subroutines, passing parameters, local variables, those are all really important topics. Um, so I'm going to uh, do the homework assignment during the lab time. If you want to see how I do it or have questions about the homework assignment, you can go we can go ahead and deal with that uh, during the lab time. Um, but for now, we are going back to the stack. And then this time, we are going to take a look at, well, okay, first of all, we're going to take a look at you know, a wrong combination of using push L, uh, push W, pop L, and pop W. And then we'll take a look at the instruction sequence so that we can do all of those things, but, but, but without using the push and pop instructions. And then we're going to move on to call and return, okay? So we'll be, I will be lucky to be able to finish up, you know, the call and return stuff today because at 10 o'clock, uh, Damon Antos, Professor Antos, is going to come in uh, with an evaluation form. It's my semester of getting evaluated, but he's not going to sit in here to observe because it's plan B, okay, because we alternate between A and B. A means the uh, evaluation evaluator is going to sit here and actually watch me do the lecture and then uh, Plan B means you know they only need the evaluation from you guys. Okay, so with that <coughs> out of the way, let's go ahead and um, first thing I'm going to do is to point you to where the notes is so that you guys know where to read about all of this stuff here. We are moving on to subroutines, which is a pretty big topic too. Um, and this is one of the, those kind of important ones because all, because all the problems that you can end up with in C and C++ programming, all the really obscure memory corruption problems, well, not all, but most, can be explained you know, by understanding how the stack works okay, and how arrays work. So this is a really important topic as far as using this class to help you debug your C and C++ programs. So far, we have covered the majority of the stack. Uh, using the stack in assembly language programming, we kind of go along with that too. Um, I'm targeting to see if I can finish your call and return today, but since we only have one hour of lecture, we may not be able to finish this. So let's go ahead and start with uh, what we talked about last time. But this time, I intentionally put in certain mistakes in the program, okay? Well, not, not necessarily mistakes, but you know, things that normally is not done, okay? <clears throat> so I'm just, uh, I'm just going to test, call this program test1.s, and all it is going to do is to illustrate the point. So I have a push long instruction here. Um, because the x86 is a risk, excuse me, is a CISC architecture, you can push immediate, okay, which normally cannot be done if you are using a risk processor. So this is a shorthand, you know, most of the time with a risk architecture, you have to move the constant into a register first, and then you can push the register on the stack. But in a CISC architecture like the x86, this is actually possible. So what I'll do is I'm going to push a long or 32-bit um, constant here onto the stack. We'll just call this, you know, one, two, three, four, eight, uh, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So this is one number that I'm pushing, and then I'll use a push W or push word to push another constant onto the stack. Uh, this one's going to be A B C D in hexadecimal. So this way, these two numbers are very, very distinct. What I want you to do is to tell me what is going to be in E A X and what is going to be in EX. That's the entire program. I'm not, I, I won't even bother to write the exit code because we are going to stop after the pop W instruction. All right, so what do you do with this? How do you figure out the answer when I ask you what is going to be in EAX and what is going to be in EX? If you, you want to look at how memory is going to be laid out? Very good. Okay, so that really is the right step to do. So what we'll do, or what I'll do, is I'm going to use a spreadsheet to help you visualize what is going to be on the stack. Um, this is from my previous class. Some of you may recognize this. It's actually still useful stuff, but what? new spreadsheet. There we go. 
All right, so what we'll do is we are going to take a look at the memory content, and I'm going to use one cell per byte, okay? One cell per byte, so this way we can clearly see how, you know, the bytes are going to be organized, okay? So originally, let's just say that ESP is pointing to this location, okay? And can someone remind me, you know, what is ESP pointing to? <clears throat> It's the last thing that we pushed, okay? And since I have no idea what was the last thing that we pushed, I will just put a question mark here. Is that okay? So this is the initial state of the entire program. The ESP or the stack pointer is pointing to something, but it's pushed by the operating system and not by me, and as a result, I have no idea what is the content of that byte. So we, now we execute the push long instruction. When you push long, you are going to do two things. The first thing it does is to change ESP. In other words, the first thing it's going to do is it will lower ESP by four bytes so that it now points to four bytes below what it used to. And then it's going to copy the constant or whatever the operand is to these four bytes. Okay, but now we have a, we have a problem because how do we organize these four bytes? <clears throat> the number itself, you know, 0x, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, does not have any type of ordering because we just have most significant versus least significant bit. But when you store these 32 bits into four individual bytes, then you have to decide which part of the 32-bit number goes into which byte. What do you guys think? It's going to follow the same rule that we have been using since the beginning of this class, which is called little endian, okay, which means the least significant byte is stored at the lowest address. So what is going to be in this particular cell here? What do you think is going to be the byte here? It's going to be the most significant byte because memory goes lower, okay, so this is, this is high memory location, this is low memory location, so given that is how I order memory, what do you think is going to be here? It's the one two because it is the most significant byte, and here comes the second most significant byte, three four, and here comes the third, or the second least significant byte, if you want to call that, and then this is the least significant byte, or the seven eight. Are there any questions about <clears throat> the first step after the first instruction? So just to indicate you know, this is ESP at the beginning, I'm just gonna make it more clear. So this is the initial ESP, and this is going to be the ESP right after the push out instruction. So after push out. Okay. And just make it a little bit. There we go. All right. So now we are ready to execute the second instruction. Push W, push word. Um, in hexadecimal A, B, C, D, immediate. What do you think that's going to do? First thing it's going to do is it will adjust the stack pointer. Okay, so it will adjust the stack pointer because this time we only have two, two bytes, it's going to lower the stack pointer to here. So after the push W instruction, ESP will point here. What do you think will be these two bytes? Let's start with this one here. It's going to be AB because it's the most significant part of that 16-bit. And this is going to be CD because it's the least significant byte of the 16-bit word. Are there any questions about <coughs> the organization of memory as well as how the stack pointer gets changed along the way? Okay, no questions. And you can still see that the stack pointer always points to the last item that we push on the stack. Okay, that part is actually kind of important. It's really useful as well. All right, the pop instruction is kind of the reverse of this, okay? In other words, it will go to where the stack pointer points to, copy those bytes, it can be two bytes or four bytes, into the destination, into the operand, and then it will adjust the stack pointer by that number of bytes up, okay? So it will go back up again. But this time when it, do, when it does the pop out instruction, it's going to do something strange because the stack pointer currently is pointing to this particular byte here. Pop L means we have to pop 32 bits or 4 bytes. So it's going to take these 4 bytes and put it into EAX. 
and then it will adjust the stack pointer so it points here. Is that okay? So let me just introduce another column here because I don't want to overlap with this stuff here. So the first thing it's going to do is to take these four bytes and copy into EAX. So that means the pop out instruction, okay, pop L, yep, cannot type, EAX will end, will end up with EAX being what number? I want the 32-bit number here. I don't want the individual bytes. We know which four bytes will be copied into EAX. I want to know what it looks like as a 32-bit as a number. What do you think? Five, six, six. Exactly. It starts with 5, 6 because that's the most significant byte. So 5, 6, 7, 8, oops, 5, 6, 7, 8, A, B, C, D. That's going to be in EAX. And then after that, the stack pointer will po end up pointing here because it's going to increment by 4. After push, oops, pop L, it's going to be here. And then the next instruction is a pop W instruction, but it's popping into BX. So I know that, let's just, t just look at BX, not EBX, because the most significant 16 bit of EBX is not I important here. So how, what, what do you think it's going to look like? It's going to be the bytes 1, 2, 3, 4, right? And it's going to be as 1, 2, 3, 4, because 1, 2 is the most significant byte. It is at the higher address, and then the 3, 4 is the lower one, so it's, a, it's the least significant byte. So that should be the result after these instructions execute, and let me just put it one more, you know, after pop W, ESP points there. I'll just make it very clear. Here, okay. just a column. All right. So now we have the whole thing. Are there any questions about this picture? So after pop W, goes to that corner. Goes all the way back to where it was. So it doesn't know what it's pointing at. Correct. Because because I I didn't push that byte on the stack, so I have no idea what it is. <coughs> Are there any questions about this part? So the prediction is when we execute this program, pop L is going to put the content uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, A, B, C, D into EAX. The pop W instruction is going to put 1, 2, 3, 4 into BX. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if that really is the case. So this is the sort of thing that you uh, you have to kind of think about is, you know, you, you kind of know normally what it does when we have matching push and pop instructions. The big question is, what if they don't match up, okay? If they don't match up, you know, what, what does the program do? Um, so, g stabs dash o I cannot type today, and I think it has to do with the desk not at the right height. Here we go. Much better. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and, well, maybe we should just run the program step by step. I'll put a breakpoint on line four. Okay. Run the program. Um, let's take a look at the uh, stack pointer first. You can look at the stack pointer just like any other registers using either IR ESP, or if you want to, you can also say print ESP with a dollar sign. But this is going to print it in decimal, which is not going to be very helpful. So it is best to, see, to specify slash x for hexadecimal, and you can see you know it's really the same thing. Okay, it doesn't make any difference. Um, that's okay, okay, because that's the initial condition, and then we single step the push out instruction. Um, and then we say, okay, tell me what is ESP at this point, and you can see it is now four bytes or four lower or four less than what it used to be. Um, and we can also look at those four bytes, okay? You know, t show me those four bytes. Do you want to show it as four individual bytes or do you want to show it as one 32-bit thing? Individual, okay, so let's show it as four individual bytes in hexadecimal and starting at where the stack pointer is or, or we're using the stack pointer as the address of the of the X or examine command, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But it seems like it's backward because it is 
Little India. Okay, seven eight is the one with the lowest address, and one two is the one with the highest address. Okay. Single step one more time. This is after the push W instruction. So we'll take a look at the stack. Well, let's take a look at the stack pointer first. It is now two less than what it used to be because we just pushed a two byte thing on the stack. And then when we examine the content on the stack, this time we can examine six bytes. And we can see that the lowest byte is CD. And then the next lowest byte is AB. That's the ABCD, you know, the 16 bit. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as the most, as the, uh, high, the highest four bytes. Are there any questions at this point? This is just another way to visualize what I showed you in the spreadsheet, but you really should be getting used to this way because this is how you debug your program. So you have to kind of get used to how to look at the output in GDB. All right, so we're now single stepping the pop L instruction. And right after that, first thing to do is to take a look at the stack pointer. The stack pointer is now going from A to E, which means it's four more than what it used to, okay? Which makes sense. The question now, the bigger question is what is in EAX at this point? It is five, six, seven, eight, A, B, C, D. Let's go back to the spreadsheet and cross check. Five, six, seven, eight, A, B, C, D. That's how we predicted, so that's good, okay? Everything is consistent. And then we can now single step the next instruction, which is the pub W instruction, and uh, take a look at the stack pointer. It is now, it, it went from 8E to 90, which means it went up by two, okay? Just like what we predicted. Um, but we also want to look at the register. So let's say print slash X BX. It is one, two, three, four, going back to the spreadsheet. That's also how, what we predicted that BX should have at this point of the program. So everything kind of went the way it's supposed to, which is great, okay? Because now not only do we have a demonstration of you know, what push and pop instructions do, but also in addition to that, we also know, well, it's a, it's a, it's a repetition of the commands in GDB that you probably <coughs> should have known already. It's just that you know, the stack pointer is one of the newer registers because we use EAX all the way to EDX before, but now we can also introduce ESP as a register. Are there any questions about all this stuff here? Yep, go ahead. You know, you said this was when they match up, but what about if they don't match up? Well, if what you think the program should do does not match up with GDB, the chances are GDB is right. <laughs> <laughs> which means the prediction or the mechanism that you used for the prediction is wrong. So in that case, you have to find what, when does it start to deviate, okay? If the end result differs, okay, something you know, did not go the way you thought it would go, but then you have to find the first point where it starts to deviate, okay? Once you locate the first point when it starts to deviate, then you have to examine stuff, okay? It could be just a silly mistake, right? You can't, you know, you, you could be just not reversing the bytes correctly or something like that. It could be a conceptual problem, which is a more important thing. But in either way, you know, discovering that your understanding does not match the uh, output of GDB is actually a good thing, okay? It's a good thing because, one, you find out before the exam, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and two, it's also you know, a good way to study. Okay? You know, because once you, once you find out they're different, then you think about it. And by thinking about it to figure out why it is not the same, that I think is the best way to study. Because it's not memorization anymore. You're actually applying what you already know about the subject matter to try to explain it. If you still cannot explain it, you can always come see me or just ask me that question too. Is that kind of answering your question? Okay. All righty, so we are pretty much done with push and pop. Um, the next thing is to say, okay, if we do not have the instructions push and pop, can we still do something like this? In other words, with a really minimalist risk architecture, can we still do things you know, that we just did earlier? So what I'll do is I'm going to copy test one to test two, and then we'll take a look at test two and say, 
Well, in a, in a risk architecture, you know, how, what do we do to push a constant 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 as a hexadecimal number onto the stack? Okay. Well, the first thing we notice in, with most risk architectures is you don't, you don't have a gazillion addressing modes with the push instruction. It can, when you push, or you can only push like a register, but we don't even want to use push. So what do we do? Well, the first thing is you want to move the constant into a register first, okay? Whatever register you want to use is fine. Now, this is not a common approach for the x86 architecture for two reasons. The first reason is we do have all the other addressing modes, so why bother with all this new stuff when we can use the other addressing modes? But the second reason, which is even more important, is we only have like four general purpose registers. A risk architecture like the ARM processor on your cell phone, on your tablet, and stuff like that, that thing has 32 general purpose registers. So it's no big deal to blow one or two registers for like you know, constants and stuff like that. But with your x86 architecture, for backward compatibility purposes, it only has four or you know six. You know, if you count some of the other ones, your general purpose registers. So you don't want to use you know uh, registers unnecessarily. But for illustration purposes, this is what we're going to do. Okay. So we are now copying the constant that we want to push on the stack into a register into a register first. And then what we do, remember what I did in the spreadsheet? We move the stack pointer first, right? We adjust the stack pointer. How do I adjust the stack pointer? Do we have the instructions to adjust the stack pointer by four? We are not adding. Four is correct, but we are not adding. Because remember what we did? The oh, stack yeah. pointer goes lower, yeah. okay? So we have to subtract. Or you can add negative four, you know, that's exactly the same thing. So we subtract four from the stack pointer. That would adjust the stack pointer first, okay? And then the next step is going to copy those four bytes to where the stack pointer is pointing to. So that's a move long instruction. EAX is the source. Indirect ESP is the destination. So these three instructions, okay, from the first move out instruction to the last move out instruction here, those are three instructions we basically do one single push long immediate instruction. But this is a risk style of programming. It does work for the x86 architecture, but we, we end up blowing one of the registers, which is kind of a big deal for the x86 architecture. Okay. Are there any questions about these three instructions? Okay, if there are no, no questions about this, we can do the same thing with the next one. So we comment this out and then we say move W in this case into A, B, C, D into a register. We can reuse A, okay, it's not a big deal. We can just you know, copy this to A, X this time. Uh, subtract long, two from ESP. And then we move W, A, X to where ESP points to. Okay, same deal, right? Okay, copy the constant into a register first, and then we adjust the stack pointer, and then we copy the register that has the constant to where the stack pointer points to. I'm doing this entirely using risk style, so that's why I don't use a move word immediate into ESP indirect because that is not available for any type of risk architectures. Zero X. Oh, yeah, we forgot the X. There we go. All right, so knowing this is what we do with push, let's see how we can do the pop, okay? So pop is kind of the same thing, okay? In fact, it is a little bit easier, okay? Uh, we know that we have to adjust the stack pointer, and we also have to copy indirect stack pointer to the destination. The question is, in which order? What do we do first? Copy first, copy first. exactly. And that has to do with the stack pointer is pointing at the last item that we push. So you might, might as well utilize the stack pointer first and then adjust it, okay? So we have a move, oops, I commented the wrong line here. <clears throat> so the first thing we do is we have a move long, okay, to, to copy from where the stack pointer points to, to the destination, in this case it is EAX. And then we just have an add long instruction to add four bytes in this case, 
excuse me, not adding four bytes, but just adding four to the stack pointer because we want to move it up by four bytes. That's it, two instructions. And then with the next one is a move byte, uh, excuse me, move word instruction, indirect ESP to BX, and then we adjust the stack pointer by two. That's it. Are there any questions about test two, which basically comment comments out all the push and pop instructions, and then instead uh, we utilize the, the really, really basic instructions that we have been using for a while. Yep? Did you say earlier that you weren't using indirect because you're doing this uh, architecture? Say that again? Did you say that you weren't using indirect? Immediate. You were using immediate. Oh. Yeah, because I could have used immediate here, so I don't have to copy the immediate into a register first. Okay. But I'm not using immediate here because I might have misspoken, but I meant immediate in the move instruction. Because with most uh, risk architectures, you cannot combine uh, immediate with indirect. Okay. Yeah. All right. So how do we know this is going to do what we think it should do? Well, GDB can help, right? Okay. So let's go ahead and test it out. Much better, you know. The the height of the workstation, you know, matters. This the program, and I feel kind of confident this is going to do what it is supposed to do. So we'll, I'm going to put a breakpoint at line 24. Run the program, no crashing. We say print x, print slash x e a x. Okay, that's the same as last time and bx is also the same as last time. So now we have a the proper sequence to, to do push and pop, but without using dedicated instructions to do it. Okay. Are there any questions about this? No questions? Excellent. We got half an hour left. We can probably finish call and return now. Okay. Cool. Okay, so what I'll do first is to give you a test program, but in CPP, it's a C++ program. Um, we are not going to worry about return values and stuff like that, or passing parameters and anything that is complicated like that. So what we are going to do is just to say, let's call a subroutine. That's all we're going to do. And yeah, just to make it more fun, we can have something like this. That makes the program so much more complicated, right? Okay, so what do you think is going to be the sequence of the execution of this program? If I turn on line numbers, can someone tell me you know, the, the, the ordering of the lines that I'm gonna traverse when we execute this program? We start off with line 12, and then where do we go? To line seven, and then we go to well, line three, okay, because you know, the end curly brace is actually significant. It is the end of the subroutine. So we go to line three, but after line three, where do we go? That's the big question. We go to line eight, because it's the line after the call, and then after line eight, where do we go? Line 13, and then after line 13, the program exits. Okay, very good. Okay, so we do have a basic understanding of how calling and returning work in C++. Okay, you know how they're supposed to to function, but the big question is how how do we do this in assembly? That's the next question. So what I'll do is I'm going to write a program to do exactly that, but in C plus uh, in assembly. So we'll do a vim o test three dot cpp on one side, test three dot s on the other side. So this way we can show both the C code or C plus plus well. It's just regular C, right? it, it, there's no object-oriented code here. We can show the C code and the assembly code at the same time. So in assembly, you have to make sure that you switch to the text section here, because you know, you're not supposed to run any code in the data section. Underscore, start, eh, we can do dot global first. Okay. The ordering does not really matter, you can put dot global anywhere you want. 
and then we have G first, okay? So G colon defines a label G, and the, does subroutine G do anything? It doesn't do a single thing, right? Okay, fine. Then it has a one single return instruction. So RET stands for return. It is the same thing as RETURN in C++, okay? All it does is to say this subroutine is now done, return, okay? And then we define function f. You know, f as a label is only defining the entry point of the subroutine. In assembly language programming, there's no clear beginning or end of a subroutine. A subroutine invocation ends when we when it gets to the return instruction. <coughs> That's it. Okay. So in f, the first thing it's going to do is to call g. So how do we call subroutine g? How about that? Okay. And what do we do after we call G in F? There's nothing else to do? Return. Okay, so, so far I know it is syntactically different, but in terms of concept, it doesn't seem to be that different. Right? And, yep? Well, uh, the function or command return, it's going to return the contents of F, for example, or it's going to return to a story? What is it going to return to? Okay, how about this? Would that make any difference? It doesn't make any difference, right? The return statement is just going to say, it's time to return, time to go home. Yep? Um, basically, another question. Does, can, does it have a capability of returning the value? Uh, not right now. Okay, so right now we're only concerned about control flow, which is you know, the ordering of the instructions, okay. but not so much of you know, returning a value or passing parameters or you know, okay. local variables and stuff like that. So we'll get to that later, okay? All right, so now in the main program, since we don't have main, we have underscore start instead, we just say call f, okay? And then we can put, well, we can always put in the, ac the actual exit code here. So I'm going to put that in, like so. All right, left-hand side, C++ code, right-hand side, assembly code. Any questions? Yep. So F and G are just labels, right? They're really just labels, correct, yeah. If you forget this RET here, then G is really just a label. It becomes the same as F. So in assembly language programming, there really is no such concept as this is the beginning of a subroutine, this is the end of a subroutine. Whenever you get to an RET, that's the end of the subroutine. Okay. Yep? Um, what, do three lines go, what exactly is the purpose of it? Which three? The move, L, move, L, and exit. Oh, that's just the exit code. That's the usual exit code that we do. Okay. Yeah, that's, I can explain that, but later. Okay, so right now we just look at those three lines and say that's the same thing as exit zero. Okay. okay. All right, so let's go ahead and um, assemble the assembly version of this code. List the program. Let's put a breakpoint on line 11, which is the first uh, instruction to execute. <coughs> Okay, so line 11 calls F, we are now in F, it calls G, we are now in G. G says return, we, goes, we go back to F, and then F returns, we go back to quote unquote main, which is underscore start. Now we are in the exit code, we continue execution, the program just exits normally. In other words, it kind of does what it's supposed to. And it took us, what, five minutes. But wait. The big question is, how does this have anything to do with the stack? Does it have anything to do with push and pop? What is happening here? How does the subroutine, how does return RET knows that it has to go back to a certain point? Now call is kind of easy, right? Because when you say call F, how do you know you're supposed to continue execution at label F? Because it's spelled out. Okay, it's the same thing as jump to label F. Okay, okay, that's the destination. We continue execution at the label. But return is tricky because RET does not have any parameters. 
doesn't have any operands. It's just RET. So how does RET know that it's supposed to go back to this point where the call happened or right after the call happened? What do you think? The context so far is around the stack, right? So what do you think stores the return address? The stack. The stack, exactly. <laughs> Okay, but this is why I ordered the topics the way I do. You know, first introduce the stack, push and pop, and now we look at call and return as somewhat special call, I mean, the push and pop instructions, okay? So we're gonna run the program again, but this time, we are not just gonna run it. We'll also examine the stack pointer and also what is on the stack along the way, okay? That's, that's kinda important. All right, first thing first, I want to know what is the current um, EIP or the enhanced mode instruction pointer, which is the program counter, okay? So I want to take a look at that, which is IR EIP, okay? Uh, it's no big deal, you know, it, it's gonna stay on the screen for long enough, so I'm not gonna write it down. I can always scroll back up to this point if I need to. But I just want to show you this is the address of the call instruction itself. Okay, so we're just going to keep an eye on this. <clears throat> and we also want to take a look at, uh, well, I can use IR too, IR ESP. I want to look at the stack pointer, okay? It's the same as in the previous program. No big deal. Um, I didn't push anything at this point. I have not pushed anything at this point. So what is at this location? I have no idea what it is, and I don't care, okay? So now we single step the call instruction, okay? First thing we notice is now we're at the label F, okay, which is fine. We knew we, we know that from the previous run of this program. But what is EIP and what is the stack pointer? The EIP is, is the easy part. I'm not going to show that. Um, what is ESP? Ooh, it's kind of doing the same thing as a push L instruction. In other words, the stack pointer is now four less than what it used to be. Okay, well, if it is four less than what it used to be, I'm suspecting it pushed something on the stack, okay? But let's take a look at what those four bytes are. So we use the X command and say, show me the four things. Each one is a byte displayed in hexadecimal and use the current content of ESP as the address. Let's go there. Mm, that doesn't look like you know, much to me. Maybe I should look at this as a 32-bit thing in hexadecimal. Ooh, yeah. Mm. What do you think? What does it look like to you? That's an Looks like an address. Does it seem close to underscore start from uh, EIP? Yes. Does it look like they're kind of related? This turns out to be the address of the instruction after the uh, call instruction. It is the address of the instruction after the call instruction, which is also known as the return address, okay? When we return, this is going to be used and say, oh, we need to go to that location. Is yep. that the address that the uh, start after the call instruction, call instruction or the other? Uh, it's, after, it's right after the call F instruction in underscore start. Okay. And we will check this again. When we get back to that instruction, we can also always double check. Okay. Yep. What was EIP again? EIP is the program counter. The program counter always points to the next instruction that we're going to execute. And that's why it is very important. It's important. Okay. All right. So now that we know that it pushed the return address before it continues execution in subroutine F, now we're supposed to call G. So we expect about the same thing is going to happen. So we will take a look at um, EIP first. I R E I P. It is in F. You can actually see that uh, the assembler tries, I mean, uh, the GDB, the debugger, tries its best to give you symbolic names. We are now in F, okay? So we just have to remember, okay? You know, the call instruction in F is at this particular address. It ends with 5.5. Five. We also want to take a look at, well, we took a look at the stack pointer already so we can continue execution. Single step, okay, there we go. We are now in G, and you can also see GDB is trying its very best to tell us that we are in subroutine G, okay? And we have to examine a few things. The first one is going to be 
uh, the stack pointer. So we want to take a look at the stack pointer first. Uh, I R E S P. The stack pointer compared to what it used to be, what do you see as the change? It was 8C before, now it is A8. It's 4 less than before. Because C is 12, 8 is 8, 12, uh, the 12 minus 8 is 4. Okay. Um, so we also want to look at, well, what are those 4 bytes? Okay. This will show us you know, the 4 bytes that we just put on, push on the stack. And it is blah, 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 5A. Hmm. Let's take a look at the displays or the change here. 5B was the call instruction itself, and 60 was the address pushed on the stack. What is 60 minus 5B, which is basically 16 minus 11? 5, right? And then we look at these two, okay? We have 55 five being the instruction of the call, the call instruction itself, and this is the address pushed on the stack. What is A minus 5? Five? 5. It's also 5. And 5 turns out to be the, the length of the call instruction itself. Okay? Is that making any sense so far? Okay? All right. So now we are in G, okay? Because this return instruction that we are just about to execute in, is in G. So when we single step, we are going back to F. So single step, we are now back to F. First thing is to re-examine the stack pointer, and we can see that the stack pointer went from A8 to 8C. In other words, it is four more than what it used to be. That seems to be doing the same thing as a pop instruction, right? Because pop instruction would do the same thing. The question is, what is pop and how is it used? That is where, the, where we have a difference. Because in this case, the pop is actually not popping into one of the general purpose registers, it gets popped into, quote unquote, the program counter itself. In other words, where we are at this point should be the address of what we just pushed on the stack. How do we know that? We can take a look at EIP. So let's take a look at EIP. And it is at 5A. Do you remember blah, 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 5A? In fact, it's still on the screen here. That's the, that's the address that we, that we push on the stack. And it turns out to be the instruction right after the call instruction. It's the address of the instruction right after the call. Is that okay so far? Are you guys making the, the connections? Okay. So this is the mechanism of call and return. Call has two things to do. The first thing it does is to save the address of the following instruction on the stack. It's just like a push, okay? And then the return instruction. Uh, okay, that's the first thing that the call instruction does. The second thing is really easy. It's just an unconditional branch to the subroutine that you're calling. Is that okay? The return instruction also has, well, two things to do. The first thing it does is to copy whatever the stack pointer points to, and it will just say, okay, the program counter needs to be that, okay? And then the second thing it does is to increase the stack pointer by four to reclaim those four bytes on the stack. But we kind of know this sequence already from the previous topic, when we implemented push and pop using individual instructions. That's kind of you know how we did things. Is that okay? So, are there any questions about this trace, <coughs> about you know how the stack pointer and the content on the stack? got changed along the way when we call and return. Kind of confusing. Kind of confusing? Yeah. Okay, so maybe this will help clarify or make it or make it worse. It's always one of those deals, right? So test3.s on one side, test3a.s on the other side. Oops, I forgot a dash o. There we go. Okay, so on one side we have the original code, and then on the other side, I'm going to write this using no call, no return, no push, no pop. But some of I need to introduce one additional instruction or one additional operand, and when we get to that, we'll talk about that. Okay, so G is here. I'm not gonna say anything here first. F is here. Okay, how do we call? Remember what I said, a call instruction needs to save the address of the following instruction, and then it has to 
um, continue execution at the label. So, well, we know there's a jump, okay, that's good. But that's the second step. What is the first step? Move immediate G to register? Mm, it's not G that I'm interested in, it's the instruction or the return instruction here. Whatever instruction is supposed to go here, the address of the instruction needs to be pushed on the stack. So how do we do that? Say again? You need the address of F, which is where you're coming back to. It, it needs the address of the question mark, question mark, and we need to copy that on the stack. How do we do that? There's an easy way to do it. It looks kind of clumsy, but it, it works. Okay, so we can say F underscore return address. We define that to be the label. So now we know how to push it on the stack, right? So we say move long dollar F underscore return address. Pick one, you know, poor register. <coughs> because remember, we are doing everything risk style, right? So we copy this, and then what we do is we uh, lower the stack pointer by four to reserve the space for the return address. And then we copy the return address, which is now stored in EAX to whatever stack pointer points to. Okay? Is that helping? Because you know what we when we went through GDB with the code on the left hand side, we saw the effect of these things, we just didn't know how it happened. This is basically spelling out the call instruction and say, oh, you can do the call in a clumsy way by doing it this way. It's clumsy, I mean, it, it does take a lot more instructions, but it accomplishes exactly the same thing. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So the same thing applies to um, call F, okay? You know, so we are basically doing the same thing here. So we move along um, main return address to EAX, I'll define that later. Subtract long for from ESP to reserve the space on the stack. And then we say move long EAX to indirect ESP because we are now saving the return address on the stack. And then we have an unconditional branch to F this time because we are calling F. And then here, right after the jump unconditional branch instruction, we define the label main return address to mark where we are supposed to go back to. But in this case, we, all, we know exactly what we want here is the exit code, which is move one to EAX, move zero into EBX, and int zero X uh, eight zero. Okay, so that's good. One mystery is solved, call is now handled. What about return? Well, return is for something kind of like this. If I could do this, this is what it is supposed to do, okay? It's supposed to do something like this move long ESP to EIP, and then it wants to increase uh, the stack pointer by four to reclaim that space, the space that, were, that was used for the return address. But it has multiple flaws here, okay? This is not gonna work. The first thing is, if I could, I'm gonna close the door. I think they're running the edge. That is why we need to get rid of lawns. <laughs> I got rid of my lawn and no edger, no mowing, no nothing, man, it was easy. Just my wife going to the yard and, you know, plant flowers and stuff like that. I don't have to do a single thing, that's the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so this is not gonna work because EIP as a, cannot be accessed as a general purpose registers. So it doesn't, it cannot be used as an operand. So that's the first problem. But even, even if I could use EIP as a second operand with the move out instruction, it's not gonna work either because it will continue execution right away to the return address. It's not gonna execute add long for to ESP. So this is not gonna work. Okay, if this is not gonna work, 
maybe if I change this to EAX, and then we can use EAX in the instruction after this. So this is going to be OK with these two instructions, because moving ESP to EAX, hey, we have seen that already. We have done it before. Adding 4 to ESP, not a problem. We have done that before. In fact, this is the same thing as pop L into EAX, if you remember from the previous program. Now the question is, I know the return address is now in EAX. How do we get there? Okay. As it turns out, there is an instruction that can use jump here. It's kind of like this, but this is the wrong syntax. It doesn't like this syntax here. It's not this either. Okay, I actually tried all of these things. It's not that either, even though that really is kind of what we want to do. The syntax is this, using the asterisk. Okay, but the effect is using EAX to tell the jump instruction <coughs> where to go to continue execution. That's the Okay. It's just a syntactical thing that it's the, it doesn't seem to be consistent with the rest of the assembly instructions, but that's what it does. But this is return. This is actually doing what return is supposed to do. <coughs> so that means we can use the same three instructions over here, because that's also where we're supposed to return. Is that okay so far? Kind of? Okay, let me turn on the line numbers so I can kind of more clearly indicate. There we go. So if you look at lines 11 to 15, okay, from line 11 to line 15, that's really just call G. Okay, it's long, it's spelled out, but it is just your call G. Uh, from line 16 to line 18, that's just return. Are there any questions about the risk equivalence of the call and the return? No questions? Okay. Well, let's let's see if whether it does what it's supposed to. Okay, so we'll exit from all. Okay. And then we assemble. That's 3A, link, and run it. OK, so we'll put a breakpoint on G. We'll put a breakpoint on F. And let's see. We'll put a breakpoint on F return address, OK, so just so that we know that we came back from G. And we'll put also put a breakpoint uh, at main return address so that we know we actually got back to that point. So I'm just going to run the program at full speed except for the breakpoints. So the first thing we do is we stop at, oh, okay, that's not good. Okay, this is the program again because I, I forgot to put a breakpoint on the first instruction, which is line 21. Put breakpoint at line 21, run the program again. Okay, so we are about to call F at this point. I continue execution at full speed. We are now um, about to call G. Now we get back. Now we're in G. You can tell that we're in G right here because it says it says we're in G. Okay. So in G, this is the return instruction. The next time I stop, I should be um, back to function F. We are back to function F. It, we are about to return from function F at this point. And then we should be back to main return address, which is in quote unquote main, you know, underscore start. So in other words, the ordering of these labels or the ordering of getting to these different labels and breakpoints is consistent with the previous program. Okay? Now if anyone wants to you know, single step through the entire program just to make sure the sequence is correct, go ahead. Okay? If you want to examine what is on the stack to make sure it is consistent with what we have just talked about, Go ahead, because that's actually a good exercise, okay? All right, so do we have any questions about the role of the stack and the stack pointer when it comes to calling and returning from subroutines? Well, it makes you wonder what else is on the stack, right? If the return address is on the stack, what else is on the stack? All of your, when you write a program in C and C++, 
your um, local variables are on the stack. Your parameters are on the stack. There are other things on the stack too. We'll talk about that later on. And the return address is also on the stack. So no wonder when you overwrite an array, a local variable array inside the subroutine, you can end up trashing the return address. Okay? Because it really is just one of those things on the stack and the, the program relies on those locations having the correct value in order to do the return correctly. So if you overwrite and trash the return address on the stack, your program is going to crash. Is that making any sense? This is getting back to one of the first programs that I wrote in this class. You know, it is intentionally um, doctored to behave you know, badly but in a very cryptic way. But this is starting to kind of let you know why you know we could write programs like that. Okay. We're talking about the one where it was shifted half. Yeah. yeah. Well, the one shifted by half is not cannot be explained using the return address. The return address can use can end. Um, remember the one when main calls f, but f returns to g instead instead of back to main. This can explain that because we can. Uh, change the return address to go to not back to main but to another subroutine. So this one explains explains that. The other one where we have all the registers you know, shifted by one half, that one has to do with the frame pointer. We will talk about the frame pointer in this class, not right now, but it will we'll, we'll get to it before the end of the semester. But the stack is important, but C and C++ does not give you sufficient protection against corrupting important parts of the stack. And that's why C++ programs can end up behaving not only badly, but strangely as well. Okay. Any questions? Very good. I ended up doing everything that I set out to do and with two minutes to spare. <laughs> <laughs> and Damon is still not here. He has the key so he can actually come in here. Um, so what we'll do is I'm going to give you a preview of what we are going to talk about after this. I think you know this also helps to explain how recursion works, right? When you have a subroutine that calls itself, every time it calls, what do you think happens to the stack? We push another return address, right? And then when it, when it returns, it just returns to the previous level and then returns to the previous level. So this is starting to, I'm hoping that it starts to explain you know, things that might seem kind of mysterious in your previous classes, like, oh, how does recursion work? This may help explain it, okay? So what uh, we are gonna talk about next would be local variables and return value. Return value is a simple one, okay? There's only one word I have to say, E-A-X. <laughs> Whatever you put into E-A-X is the return value, yep. If Damon's going to be late, which he usually is not, I'm going to demonstrate how to return a value and how to write a program that is partially written in C++ and partially is written in a pure assembly. Okay? It's going to be fun. So I'll call this the main program. It's just going to be main. Okay? So we'll just say int main and x equals to Johnny turn zero, and I have to give Johnny a prototype because otherwise the compiler will complain and say, I don't know how to use Johnny. There you go. Okay, this is the C code. The C code simply means, simply says, there is a subroutine called Johnny. It returns an integer, but it doesn't contain the definition. Then I write Johnny, J-O-H-N-N-Y dot C. Yes? Yep. Say again? Declare X. Oh, I forgot. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, but since we're here, we might as well just do Johnny first. Right, Johnny. J O. Oh, he's here. Okay. Well, this is it. Um, can I use another two minutes? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so this is Johnny as a pure assembly subroutine. Okay, you, know, you can see it only copies 5 to EAX and then a return instruction. Go back to main.cpp. Uh, we have to declare X. Thank you. 
and it calls Johnny. It uses the return value of Johnny, put it into X, and it returns. So let's go ahead and just do it real quick here. G plus plus dash O main. Uh, we also want a dash G for debugging. Um, main dot cpp Johnny dot s. Go. Oh, doesn't like it. Our global. Oh, misspelled. Did I misspell Johnny? I must have. J O H N N Y. J O H N N Y. Our global. Exported that correctly. CPP complains about this line here calling Johnny, but Johnny is supposed to be no defined. Not there either. Sorry? No, no misspelling there either. Mm. Okay, I'll do one thing to change Johnny to Johnny dot uppercase S because I think that might be it. Nope. Okay, one more try. Assemble it first, and then we'll link it. <laughs> Still wants to complain. Okay, fine. We'll do it later. <laughs> Next time. In lab. It was a. Yeah, I'll go to the lab too. So in the lab, we're gonna go over the solution of today's homework assignment, and I will give you guys a general purpose substring matching algorithm instead of one that is only going to look for a coconut, okay? Now Damon's thinking, coconut? What does coconut have anything to do with this class? <laughs> <clears throat>